And we are live on the the launch. We we're taking your property investing to the next level. How how you going, everybody? How you going, Pete? Oh, very good. Thanks, uh, Jeff. Very good indeed. That's uh, yeah. It's the first day of summer, and I don't I don't know. I love summer. I love oh, the yeah. heat. I love. I don't know if it's hot hot down there in Adelaide at the moment, but um, it's just amazing to see the 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 energy and the heat, and and that's why we're excited to have you as a guest um, for for this session and to really unpack Adelaide and just do all these things. So, how are you going, Joe? I'm good, mate. I'm good. I'm very excited. We have the property professor. Um, I've been a fanboy of yours for years, and I've just heard that we've got a, you've got an exciting new venture with a new book with Margaret Lomaz and yourself. So that is actually going to be sensational. So I'm absolutely pumped for this conversation. I think there's going to be so much value shared. What about you, Jeff? How are you, mate? Mate, hey, good, good, good day, good day. Just start uh, winding down, and just a final push before Christmas because um, we, we we take uh, two two weeks over Christmas off. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited for that, but also excited to just keep building Ozprop and just keep bringing the value. So I, I, I would do, I was going to say I'd do this for free, but um, we kind of do do it for free. But you know, it's an exciting time. So throw the comments, throw the questions and, and, and any, we'll, we'll get to as many of those as we can as we, as we go at the end. So I'm excited to, to talk to Pete. Jeff, we always jump into uh, a bit of a quote of the week. So what is, what is your quote of the week, mate? So I've, I've memorized, so I've seen a lot of posts in the group on the the sort of the markets um, sort of going, oh, cooling off and that sort of thing. So, and even there's the, the couple of articles. So my quote is, things are never usually as bad as what people think they are. And they're never usually, or they're not usually as good as what they think they are either. So I would sort of, that's my kind of people, are, you're going to start probably, it's likely you'll start seeing articles saying, you know, property is going to dip quite substantially you'll start seeing that rhetoric in the media um so just that's my kind of uh, quotes and it's it's been sort of resonating around in my head over the last couple of days what about yourself joe so i like it man yeah i like it it uh, i've been looking at a lot of i've been going back in the some of the data i i read uh, your gentrification study peter i just finished that uh yesterday or the day before and it made I me want to go back to sleep, did it uh, joe no no it didn't no not quite. I didn't get it in one go. I'm like, I'll get it. I'm going to finish this in one go. And I'm All like, right. hang on. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of numbers here. Um, there's a lot to gentrification that I didn't know about. Uh, so that was that was super interesting. Um, but my quote, what was what my quote? I don't know why I brought that up. Um, so Naval Ravikant, do you know who that is, Peter? Have you ever heard of him, Naval? He's a Spanish yeah, like tennis, tennis player. <laughs> Rafael Nadal. Anyway, he's this venture capitalist who loves Twitter. Anyway, I was, I was having a look um, and he said, it's the mark of a charlatan to explain a simple complex, a, a simple subject in a complex way. And I thought that, that is um, being a, being a teacher, Peter, being a university lecturer um, and program director. I bet, do you see that very often? Do you see people that uh, try and over-explain and, and go too deep into detail when they yeah, don't uh, have an yeah, idea. Yeah, certainly do. Unfortunately, there are some very smart people at uni, but they can't explain themselves very well. Um, and they're very passionate about their particular strip of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, but, yeah, that can be an issue. Interesting. Now, I feel like we kind of sprung this quote of the week on you. Have you got yourself a favourite quote or one that you uh, like to live by? Oh, well, quote of the week would be 2021, it's almost over because it's been it's been a huge yeah. year for, you know, <laughs> teaching online as we did back in 2020. Yeah. But yeah. international students are supposed to come back next year. So very much looking forward to having some real good face-to-face -face classes next year. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine what it would be like from a teacher's perspective. Like from a work perspective, it's so tough to teach and train like new hires and new staff like students. Wow. Okay. I like it. Okay, great. Well, look, before we um, jump in, Peter, and introduce you to the um, wonderful crowd, we're going to run through our um, first sponsor and then we'll dive straight in and Jeff will give you a good run through and why you guys should be excited about this one. So tune in. Super excited. This live session is sponsored by Sales First Property Negotiation as a Service Business. So what does that mean? Well, let's think about it. When was the last time you negotiated on anything over $100? 
let alone a property that is going to be one of the biggest investments of your life. The vendor, they have a trained negotiator on their side in the form of a real estate agent. That's kind of like you stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson after never training a day of boxing in your life. These guys are trained professionals and that's what they do day in and day out. And this is what Hella House does every single day as well. They negotiate on property to get the best buy price from the real estate agents. Scott Agate, he's the expert negotiator. He has been in this industry since 1995. He owned and operated three Bell franchises. Scott was the guy that was teaching these real estate agents all these agent games. He knows all of their tricks. Having him on your side is going to give you a massive unfair advantage and literally save you tens of thousands of dollars. Unlike other ways of purchasing property, Scott's incentives are aligned with you, the buyer, meaning the more money he saves you, the more money he makes, which is what you want. You need to have those incentives aligned. Scott has kindly offered our group a massive discount on the retainer fee for his service. So if you're looking to buy your next home or investment property, click the link below to get in touch. There you go, Joe. I'll get, you. I'll go. get us all back on screen. Here we go. Very, very big Joe. <laughs> so, um, get, getting into the person, it's the, the man, the, the myth, the legend, the property professor. We, I, I want to give you a, 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 a warm welcome here and, and say that you are you are the property director of Master of Property. How cool is that? Program director, sorry, the Uni of Adelaide. And as a lecturer, you teach a whole bunch of things. So, and things that people might not know you for. So, development construction, development studio. You've done a dissertation as well. So, you've done. A whole bunch and you've 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 done more than what i can even sort of say in the space of probably this live session so you've done master of urban and regional planning you focus on gentrification re resi property markets property development as well you've done two books one in one called top of top aussie suburbs and property versus shares so you're currently doing a third book and you've done over tw uh, 20 years of teaching in property and investment so that's um i mean that's very impressive i mean I, I still haven't had any, anything like that, Pete. But uh, the question I'd love to know is, what is something that we do, that people don't really know about you that they haven't asked? <laughs> I think of all the podcasts that I've done, including my own, and all the interviews I've done, I don't think anyone who has listened to them would not know anything about me. Oh. I, was, I was a school teacher before I was a lecturer, my father was a real estate agent, hence the interest in property. Yep. But by the time I got to around 40, I wanted to combine my two passions, which was property and teaching. And so yep. here I am, an overnight success, which took about 25 years. Wow. <laughs> That's some, yeah, it's, it's really humbling to have some, because they, they say the quote is uh, everybody sort of sees the overnight success 10 years in the making. And you're sort of saying it's sort of 25, I suppose, 25 years. And it's, uh, it's great to have somebody with that depth of experience. So um, let's, let's get into the first kind of topic and, and thing that we kind of ask people about is, is what, um, what your first property purchase was. So uh, my first property purchase, or our first property purchase was our first home. Yeah. Uh, my first teaching job was out in the country, in a little country town of South Australia called Ardrossan. And yeah. we got to the got town and I needed to find some accommodation. So it was either renting or buying. Yeah. And a bit like now, it cost you about as much to rent a house as it did to pay off the mortgage. But what you needed was a deposit. And luckily, yeah. my fiance and our wife, together, we had the deposit. So we bought our uh, first house. First investment property was a few years later or several years later uh, in the town of Ardrossan, which we still have. Uh, yeah. And one of the one of the comforting things, especially when you're buying your first investment property, was the local knowledge. Because I'd lived in the town for so many years, I had a pretty good idea what was happening. I had a fairly good idea what might be happening in the future. And so, you know, here we are 30 years later and we still have it. Wow. That's... um. That's a, that's a, and, and for people watching, I, I think you should really take that in that you kind of, Peter sort of had the on the ground knowledge and, and he understood that the property was probably, a, a, a probably it, it very much is a, a longer term game. So you still own the first property uh, and not a lot of people can necessarily say that. Um, so I'll, I'll pass, pass the baton to Joe. I, there's been a lot of bought and sold in between time, but that first one we still have. <laughs> is Did it you want? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> 
Was that a good investment? Like looking back, uh, obviously, like time wise, but oh, yeah. for for I had where my you time were again. again. If I had my yeah. time again, we'd buy it. Yep. Buy another one. Yeah. <laughs> buy, if buy I had five. my time again, there would be many that I wouldn't have sold. But if I had my time again, <laughs> I, I uh, wouldn't. I would have bought this one. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Um, so what I, I want to do, Adelaide is starting to become a very hot topic at the moment, and you're an Adelaide expert. So I'd love to get like a macro understanding. Like, let's just pretend we are aliens, um, which most Sydney people are um, to, to, you know, Adelaide folk, as if you just dropped an alien into Adelaide. What are some of the macro drivers of the property market and what should we understand? Well, welcome to the country town of Adelaide. It's lovely to uh, have you visit us. Like any other country town, we depend a lot on uh, what we grow, what comes out of the ground. And so uh, our wine, uh, we're one of the biggest wine producers in Australia and exporters. And yeah. our, most of our top class wine districts are within one hour drive of the CBD. So, you know, I'm not ashamed to say, but most people don't come to Adelaide to, to visit Adelaide. They come to Adelaide as a launching pad to go to either the wine regions or Kangaroo Island or Flinders Ranges. Um, look, uh, our number one export, as it is for a number of states around Australia, is international education. So uh, international yeah. students is particularly important. Um, also uh, grain. We uh, grow a lot of wheat and barley, which we uh, export. Our average age, median age in Adelaide, tends to be a little bit higher than that for the than the rest of Australia. Um, a lot of our, there was up until COVID, uh, uh, a brain drain. A lot of our younger ones, when they finished university, accountants, lawyers, project managers, whatever it might be, went off and chased the bright lights of Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, yeah. But uh, a number of them would eventually come back, but COVID-19 has acted like a catalyst and many of them have come back just before it started or in the last 18 months and mm -hmm. and they're here to stay. But that's that's not just expats that have come back. So what, what you're finding is, uh, Jeff and Joe, that you might have, well, I know for a, for a fact that you've got less people in Sydney today than you had 18 months ago, just like yeah. there are less people in Melbourne. Uh, yeah. Most of them have gone to southeast Queensland, um, but some... Are here in Adelaide, and surprisingly, some live in Adelaide, but their work is actually based in Sydney. So for them, they got the best of both worlds because they're earning a Sydney salary, but paying yeah. Adelaide expenses. Yeah, yeah, the arbitrage is uh, is very good. So we're, um, we're also well known for being a a well planned city, Colonel Light. We got uh, our city square. Uh, which is a square mile. So north, south, east, west terrace are basically one mile long. Then we're yep. bounded by parklands, green space, and then even then the suburbs are very well planned. So Adelaide did have the name of the 15-minute city because it only took about 15 minutes to get anywhere. But since then we've grown and literally grown up because we have do have a number of high-rise towers in the city, uh, some commercial, some residential, uh, but we are certainly maturing. I'm, I must say, um, having been to Adelaide in March 2020 for the first time, just before kind of COVID really ramped up, there was um, I, I took the uh, took an Uber out to Glenelg and then caught the tram back into the city, and I was I was I was like, this is this is amazing, just to be able to the infrastructure, the the capacity to be able to get into the city, and I was like, why doesn't Sydney have more? I mean, I know we have the light rail in Sydney, but um, yeah, it was it, I was pleasantly surprised by. Um, but like, of course, there's not as many people floating, uh, walking around this sort of place. But um, it's a, it's a, it's. I feel it's an up and comer, um, and it's and it's um, warrants um, from from an investment perspective. But yeah, that's that's my. Well, uh, look, I mean, you know, we don't say much here, and really, the rest of Australia doesn't really care about us anyway. We're quite <laughs> insignificant, but you know, we often win awards for being the most livable city, not just in Australia but uh, the world, mm -hmm. uh, and also. We are, we are being noticed by Eastern States investors yep. because it is more affordable. Hobart's very expensive, relatively expensive, considering that the median income in Hobart is 15% below that of the Australian uh, median. 
house yeah. prices are well above that. And it's not because, you know, somehow Tasmanians have lots of money under the bed. It's because eastern states, people are either buying lifestyle properties or investment properties. So that's getting quite expensive now. So what they're looking to, to do is looking at more affordable areas. And if you're looking for a capital city, then Adelaide is probably your best pick. Is the yeah. best pick. Well, Adelaide and Brisbane. They'd be my two picks. Brisbane, Brisbane's going to go well. Well, Brisbane's going to benefit from interstate migration for many years to come, yeah, just okay. like happened back in the late 80s, early 90s, when uh, we had, a, number one, we had a recession, but South Australia and Victoria had very severe recessions, uh, and a lot of people moved from the south up, up to Queensland. And I can see the same happening now. Again, COVID-19 has been a big driver of that. It, uh, I'm not sure if I said when. Yeah, Sydney and Melbourne lost a lot of people, but the one the the state to, to gain the most was Queensland. Um, and so that's going to continue as a lead-up to the Olympics. But, you know, all those people that are, are watching here, let, let's not all go and buy property in, in southeast Queensland because, you know, if, if 100,000 households move up to Queensland, but then there's 100,000 ha- uh, houses built well, price is not going anywhere because in the end, price is all about demand and supply. So, but, you know, certainly I can understand the attraction of Queensland, in particular, southeast Queensland. So you can see that area continue to prosper. Uh, but it, for, uh, for those looking to invest in property, I'd be looking at Adelaide and Brisbane, Darwin, even though it's had a stellar couple of years, property prices are still below the back. which was reached like five, six years ago. Perth has only just reached their highest price. Um, yep. and so, but when I say that, like prices are only a little bit above where they were six, seven years ago. Yeah. Um, Sydney and Melbourne, they had two really good growth spurts since the GFC. I can't see that continuing in addition to the fact that a number of people want to leave the bigger cities to go to smaller cities or go to regional areas as well. Um, <clears throat> so I can see that's going to be a hindrance to Sydney and Melbourne going forward. So if you're looking for the yeah. short to medium term, it would be Adelaide and Brisbane. Yeah, it's very interesting because um, like affordability-wise, if you are an investor, like thinking about it, how many people can afford a $2 million mortgage or a $3 million mortgage to be able to buy a property? Um, so if you've got a place like, well, what's the kind of medium pri- price for some of the locations that we're looking for in, in Adelaide price-wise? So medium price in Adelaide is 600000 You can find yourself a, a very good place for that, you know, in an up-and-coming mm-hmm. suburb. But mm-hmm. my being a, maybe not a specialist, but being particularly keen on gentrification, uh, I'm focused on the gentrifying suburbs. And the mm-hmm. reality is if you want to get into those, You've got to have, you know, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars, because you're buying a house. You're not buying a unit. The house is on several hundred square meters of land, and in most cases, you're only four or five k's from the CBD. Yeah, that's um, that, that's interesting because I'd, I'd love to get a run. I, I don't know how uh, how intimately you know all all the parts of Adelaide. You probably know them quite well. But um, what's what is sort of if if you were to sort of categorise the the regions or the parts of parts of Adelaide, how would you sort of how, how would you break those up and what were they? So the two like? areas that I'd be focusing on are the gentrifying inner western suburbs. So yep. if you have a look at map of Adelaide, it's between the city and the sea. Yep. yep. And the other area is the area that I've termed the turquoise coast, which is between Christie's Beach and yep. Old Dinga Beach. There's about eight <clears throat> beachside suburbs in there. Um, yep. And if you're buying in a beachside suburb, the closer you can get to the beach, the better off you're going to be. Ideally, Esplanade, but again, that's going to cost you a million dollars. But, yeah. you know, even one or two streets back, providing you're within walking distance, that, that'll be a good start. And when you say inner west, are we talking as far out as places like Semaphore? Or are we talking... Um, no, no, Semaphore... Oh. Semaphore is a good suburb, but it's a beachside suburb. But that's like that's that's about fourteen k's from town. So okay. for me, yeah. it's you know you're looking within a five k radius of the CBD. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Interesting. What's your thoughts on um, tea, tea, tea Tree Gully? Um, I'm hearing a lot of... <laughs> oh, yeah. Unfortunately, oh, a few people oh. want this. <laughs> You're the two things that drive... Well, firstly, i got to say I'm a capital growth man, all right? Yeah. 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 Now, personally, as an investor, I'm a capital growth man. Speaking and, our language. Uh, having, having studied property for many decades, I can tell you, most people become wealthy in property because of their properties have gone up in value not because they're making an extra five or 10 or 20 bucks a week in positively geared property a long way from the CBD. So if, uh, yeah. if you're going to be buying investment property for capital growth, it needs to be close to the city or very close to the sea. And tea tree, uh, tea tree government yeah. council is neither of those. I mean, look, a lot of interstate <laughs> buyers agents focus in that area because their clients come to them and say, I want to find positively geared property relatively close to the city. And in Sydney, all right, relatively close to the city might be 15, 20 days. Uh, yeah, exactly. But in Adelaide terms, that is not. Yeah, it's, 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 quite, it's quite far. Um, what are some of the more uniquely Adelaide things that we should be avoiding in our... Um... <laughs> because, you know, you come with a different city mindset. It's, it's not always a winner. <laughs> well, it's probably not avoiding, but just to take note... Like in Sydney and Melbourne, being close to public transport is really, imper uh, really important. Yeah, Nobody is. cares about public transport here, really, in Adelaide. So it doesn't matter if you're close to the train station or a bus stop. Most people yeah. drive. Yeah. And, you know, if you can't find a park outside of where you want to go, you just keep driving around the block until you find a park. So mm -hmm. we're very car-centric here. Being under the flight path is not a big deal here because we don't have as many planes as Sydney and Melbourne. And they're not as go. big as Sydney and Melbourne. So they're, they're just a couple of things to keep an eye out for. Like the public transport and flight path are not a big deal here. Okay. Do, okay. do, do you think, though, that because I, I, I sort of I quite like Adelaide, do you think if we project five or 10, 15 years and nobody has a crystal ball, but do you think that when, <laughs> as the city grows, that, that they may start to become issues? Or, I mean, no. Nah. We, what's on the ground is more important than what's above them. You know, the, the flight path is directly overhead some fantastic suburbs. Mm, there you go. And people can mitigate the noise. You know, you put in insulation in the roof and the ceiling, double glazed windows. You can deal with that. Well, it's, but, kind of, it's yeah. kind of interesting, though, because even in Sydney, like you look at the mascots, the Alexandrias, all these kind of suburbs that are under... Marrickville, St. Peter's, yeah. Tempe. Yeah. I mean, they've done quite... They've done pretty well. Yeah. yeah. Marrickville's so, done so well. Yeah. But it's so loud. Oh, in Tempe, Sydney, I was sitting as They just fly, like, directly on your head. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. <laughs> is it like that in Adelaide where the airport is just right close on Some, the sub Because the, the airport's only 5K, 6 k from the city centre. Yeah. So, you know, some suburbs are really close uh, to the runway, to the flight path, and there are some yeah. suburbs that I would say, no, no, because you are far too close. But there are others where people still pay a million, pay a million dollars. Now, to people in Sydney, that seems really cheap, but... You know, when the yeah. median house price in Adelaide is about 600 and you're paying a million to live under the flight path, doesn't that tell you that, you know, at least the people with the money are not concerned about being under the flight path? 100%. Um, do we want to – is there anything other – anything more valuable to chat to – well, there's always not value in Adelaide, but is there any other kind of questions you wanted to cover off on Adelaide? Because I'm excited to talk about gentrification, but is there anything else you, that's worthwhile mentioning? Because I know like the, the the type of asset in Adelaide is pretty important as well. Yeah, well, look, we, just like in Melbourne and in Sydney, or oh, yeah, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland, we love our character period style homes. Yeah. So anything built before World War II. You know, bungalows, cottages, villas, stone front, whether they're sandstone, bluestone, red brick, they're the classics. They're the they're the ones that will go up in property. So if you, the Adelaide is no different to any other places. You've got to find the right property, right type of property, in the right street, in the right suburb. It's as easy as that, people. It's as easy oh, as yeah. that. <laughs> you don't need to go to university or, or go to school for that. That's right. Good luck with that. <laughs> How do you get there, though? How do we do it? How do we do it? Um, so yeah, one of the hey, things... Hey, Jeff and Joe, running a marathon is pretty easy, too. 
Well, I've only run a half marathon, so you ha I'll have to tell you what that's like after I do the full one, which I've been talking about for years. Joe, we have to do that kind of marathon. I did a half marathon. It was hell. There's no way I want to double that. Why would I want to double that? <laughs> um, what? Uh, I, missed, I lost my question. When I said that, that was tongue in cheek. Running a marathon is, is not easy, but no. you can say it and it sounds easy, but to actually very do it and put say. it into practice is a very different story. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Go, Jeff. Oh, mate, Jeff, you look like you're about to ask a question every well, single I, time. I, I, kind of wanted to, I wanted to go down the rabbit hole of asking, well, you said that uh, you picked the right street, the right, the right asset and the right kind of – like ha, what, are, what are some of the, what are the top three kind of things apart from having 25 years experience plus that, that you – how somebody starting off is able to um, circum – so shortcut, I hate the word shortcut, but how do you overcome some of those challenges that experience requires? Okay, so location, as I said, close to the city or very yep. close to the sea. Now, yep. close to the city means something different in Sydney compared to Adelaide, all right? Yeah. Yep. So you work out what close to the city means in your particular location. Yep. Land is king or queen. So in other words, you're going to buy a house and not a unit. Yep. <clears throat> uh, street. Ideally, wide, tree-lined, houses set back from the front boundary, but the most important thing is you need there needs to be appealing homes within the street. Like you don't want to be buying the, the best house in the worst street. You don't want to be doing that. So, so you, if you, you can get your location right and you're buying a house and not a unit and you're buying the right type of house that is a character house, Yeah, you know, it's as easy as that. <laughs> Now, um, just to define the term unit, um, are you talking about like, uh, you know, small complexes with um, like three levels uh, above or because I know that you guys kind of name it differently down there? So the one, if there's only one thing that the people watching this remember is they should never buy an off the plan or brand new apartment. So there an apartment go. is a small dwelling in a high rise complex. Flats and units, if that's all you can afford, okay. These are older style buildings. They might be 50 or 60 years old, one level, maybe two level, and then a small group. Now, small group in Adelaide generally means eight or less. Small group in Sydney or Melbourne might mean 20 or less. Uh, ideally, you want to buy the unit the, or the flat on the ground floor and generally the one, <coughs> excuse me, facing the street is the most expensive one or the one with the most value. And the next most expensive is the one right at the back. Excuse me, gentlemen, I'm going to join you and have a drink. Yeah, no, no, certainly. Yeah. Right. Don't, don't be shy. Um, that's interesting. You said the, the, I want to get on gentrification because there's so many gems that are going to be in there. But you said the ground floor. That's that's interesting. I, I would have I would have thought that I would, I personally wouldn't have bought the ground. I wouldn't buy the ground floor. What, what I'm, I'm not, I mean, Educated. Why wouldn't you buy the ground floor, Jeff? Too scared? Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just thinking, I suppose, heat like rises. Steps. So, yeah. Well, you can buy an air conditioner. Yeah. yeah. You can buy an air, well, heat rises, so it's going to be hotter up the top, right? Yeah. There you go. Winter then, time, but I love it. it. The ground floor is accessible to the whole market. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I hadn't you thought about upstairs, that. You go upstairs, old people not interested, people with young kids are not interested. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's 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 there. You go. I've learned something today. You got to learn something every day. So thanks for. I mean, maybe that's a, that was a, feel like a stupid question now, but I, I feel like I need to <laughs> no, not at all, mate. No such thing as a stupid question. Yeah. <laughs> This is a, so we have a couple of questions and comments coming in from the group, and uh, one of the comments here says only penthouses for Jeff. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> also probably overpay, and yeah, this is yeah, a lot. So let, let's so, get in gentrification. Sorry, Jeff. Yeah, but gentrification—that's what—that's what I love to uh, learn about. You did a fantastic uh, study thesis. What what are you? What are we calling it? And um, what was the premise? The purpose? What made you want to do this? So. I mean, there are suburbs all over Australia, all over the world, where in the past nobody wanted to live high crime rate, low socioeconomic areas. But over the decades, they have gentrified. It's like a, you know, what, what do we call them? Ugly duckling turning into a graceful swan. So some of the suburbs in Melbourne, like 
you know, Richmond in the past, 50, 60 years ago, you know, where Underbelly was filmed, well, that's, that's what it was like. But now it's a very expensive area. West End in Brisbane is another one. Paddington and Balmain were not the classy suburbs that they are today. So if you can, if you can pick the indicators of early gentrification, and gentrification can take 20 to 30 years. So if you can pick it in the first few, buy yourself a property, etc. Imagine if you'd bought yourself a property in Balmain, you know, 40, 50 years ago, or in Paddington, yes. or in Richmond, or if it's you're in, Ad in Adelaide, in Unley, or in Norwood. If you knew what was going to happen, imagine if you could do that. You just sit on it and watch your capital growth accelerate. It's it's interesting you should say that because my so my my grandparents they they owned a property in Balmain in the sort of or their parents in the 1950s 1960s and of course oh, they, past they, tense is that right yeah past yeah past of course they stole there. it so I, mean, I don't know because they needed to buy somewhere else but I mean of course they bought into a suburb called Biron which I mean still probably worth a coast of well into the millions but you could just only imagine what that property in Balmain will be worth these mm. days but um yeah you're right. I like it. What were um so for the gentrification side of things, um that we know why we need to do it because gosh, there's a whole lot of capital growth there. What were some of the surprises that kind of took you took you by the surprise? <laughs> well, firstly, for gentrification to occur, for an ugly duckling, ugly duckling suburb to turn into a graceful swan, there are two prerequisites. One, you need to be close to the city or very yeah. close to water. So it doesn't have to be the sea. It could be a riverfront. And the other one is you need a relatively high concentration of historic buildings, character periods, dog dwellings. Okay. And gentrification occurs all over the world. This is not just an Australian thing or Western world thing. It happens all over the world. But those two things are critical. Like you can't knock down an area which had lots of low-quality housing, build new, like, say, in Darling Harbour or the Docklands, that's not gentrification. That's called urban renewal. But And when you do that, the area loses its soul. The area loses its character. One of the keys to gentrification is we need to keep the historic buildings and upgrade them. And um, pro probably an example, uh, I, I mean, I, I feel it's an example, um, correct me if I'm wrong, is, is the rocks in Sydney. Like you sort of see yeah. a lot of those waterfront places that were public housing that, that, have, that have sold off for five, I think they sold for $5 million or in excess of $5 million a couple of years ago. And you just sort of say, but wow. That the one thing you can't change your property is its location. Mm -hmm. You can, you know, you can uh, change them, you can make the buildings bigger, extend them. Yeah. You can get rid of them. You can knock them down if you want. But the one thing you can't change is the location. That's right. And, and unless, I mean, if I'm going to be cheeky, if you could, you could grab a grab, <laughs> grab a grab a transport or move them somewhere else. But no, you can't. You're right. Sorry. Yeah, but the la it's the land that's the most profitable bit. That's yeah. where the value is. It's Thank you for land. reminding us. <laughs> the land's annoying. not going anywhere. No. <laughs> What's with you in questions today, Jeff? Has is is, is Peter made you nervous? You're asking all the silly ones. Well, I'm, no. I'm the teacher. I'm the lecturer. Yeah. You're the, I feel like, I feel like I'm supposed to do it. I, I was, when, when I was in school, I was sort of, I would do my work and I would start talking. I would get in trouble and, and the teachers would sort of say, you know the Bart Simpson analogy where the grades go down. I think I was the Bart Simpson of the class. So I'm, I'm sorry for that, people. <laughs> So can you give us a run through of some of the, the data and the metrics that you looked at to be able to get this uh, gentrification study going? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't have time to go through all of them because we're already halfway through our session, but I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase, all right? Here, here's my like thesis it. right in front of me, all right? So four indicators that an area is in the early stages of gentrification. Number one, decrease, or not, not in any order of importance, but... The first one is... There a, is, is there an order of importance? Um, I'll tell you what I think it is. I need to do more research after I've gone through all four. One is a decrease in the percentage of people aged 18 years and under. So gentrification is a childless process, which makes sense <laughs> because it's... If you've got dependents, you can't afford to pay big money to buy property. 
Yeah. 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 Or major extensions or renovations. Yep. Yeah. Next and one. That's a good point. Decrease in the proportion of couples without children. Jeez. Similar. All right. Increase in the percentage of people that lived at a different address five years ago. That is very important. It's not like an area gets more expensive because the people that have lived there for 30 years suddenly get richer. The, the blue-collar people yes. that used to live in the area move out and the white-collar people move in, all right? So there needs to be... so. Uh, this is based on ABS stats, and you can do the research yourself. So the one of the questions we're asked in the census is, where were you living one year ago? Where were you living five years ago? And I looked at where were they living five years ago, and gentrifying suburbs tend to have a, a greater than average compared to the state of people that lived at a different address five years ago. And the one surprising thing is an increase in the proportion of females working in professional occupations. Ooh. Not just an increase in professionals, but an increase in female professionals. I'm not, I'm not surprised about that, but I mean, because I would say if you've got a, I mean, professional industries, white collar, if you want to term it that, probably pay higher salary, therefore you can afford to pay more for property. That's right. Well, one of the indicators that, because when you do your, your research, but when you do academic research, you're going to find out what other people have done. And so if other people like look at other indicators such as uh, is there an increase in the people with bachelor degrees, right? Because generally a professional has a university degree. That's yeah. the loose term for it. I look beyond that and look not just at bachelor degrees but those with postgraduate degrees, grad diplomas or graduate certificates. Um, and so, I mean, I looked at I looked at what researchers had done around the world, in particular in, in uh, the UK and the US, uh, and I used some of their indicators, but I also considered some of my own. And I reckon for memory, nobody else looked at female professionals. Yeah. I don't and, know and why I did that. Maybe I don't... I mean, you can get, you know, you can go really deep into ABS stats. And in the ABS stats, they it's not just, oh, these are the numbers of, these are the professionals. They break them up in age groups and they break them up in gender. And, I'm, and I must have just come across it by accident. That, oh, geez, I, think you, I think you're on to something there, though, Pete, because if you, if you, can, if you can have both sort of both um, parties of a, of a couple earning more or even a single sort of female earning more money, they can... It, it, increases capacity to pay more which i think is um yeah so but that's, upon... but that's interesting single females going to an area single professional. female professionals though yeah, yeah but so right. what, why do you think what, why do you think that is i don't know going to be making some generalizations now maybe females are better at saving money than males yep. they are yep <laughs> you know maybe Maybe blokes move to a trendy area and they spend their weekends at the local bar and pub. Yeah. Whereas... Buying all the buying all the professional female the drinks so they can save on their no. house oh, yeah. deposit. There it is. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it, I, for that, you'd have to do a, um, a survey. You know, you'd have to do some questionnaires and ask people. Yeah. But mm. the, the facts show that it's female professionals that is the key. What analysis you do and conclusions you come to, but, you know, that, that could differ, you know, depending yeah. on who the researcher is. But the yeah. facts are the gentrifying areas that I looked at have a higher proportion of female professionals than the state average. Yeah. Mm. And you, you've run this. How have you found it running across multiple states? Is this a generalisation? No, just I, for... for my research, I just picked oh. three suburbs in Adelaide. Foreign so if I could just redirect from the thesis. So yeah. I used three suburbs. So I used Foreign. two benchmark suburbs. One was a suburb that had already gentrified and look at its characteristics. The yeah. other one was a suburb that had no hope of gentrifying because even though it was close to the city, there was no really hardly any character homes. And yeah. then the other one, the gentrifying suburb was next door to the non-gentrifying suburb, 
So location was basically the same. The di big difference was was in housing. So so the demo so I've got here the demographic the democratic the demographic and property features of a non-gentrified suburb need to be determined. Secondly, it needs to be identified what are the demographic and property features of a suburb that has completed the gentrification process. This will give the study a virtual start and end point. Finally, the suburb undergoing gentrification, which in this case was a suburb called Torrensville, which is like Erskineville in Sydney or Yarraville in Melbourne, needs to have the demographic and property features analysed so as to determine if any of these features are more prominent in the early stages of gentrification and can therefore be used as predictive tools to help in the identification of an area undergoing gentrification. So basically, this is uh, not gentrifying suburb, gentrifying yep. suburb, a uh, gentrified suburb. It's finished. Yep, Two yep. different characteristics. Let's look at the characteristics of a suburb that's going from uh, that's just started gentrifying and see if any of them are early indicators. Now, I only okay. pick three suburbs, right? But the idea with research is somebody can pick that up, use the same methodology and apply it in, in their area and see yeah. and see what happens there. And um, one of the things that, that I don't know, someone in the comments posted this, so you don't believe everything you read on the social social media is what I say, but they said there's something called like the pink the pink money, which is about yeah. like... Uh, because so what you've got, can you, can what you you've got is two that? people working, generally no dependents. Mm -hmm. And so your borrowing capacity is much bigger than if you've got one person working and one person staying at home looking after the kids. So what would you yeah. call, what would, what's pink money for the people at home that, that have no idea what I'm talking about? Well, it, it's gay relationships, two males together, two females together, generally no dependents, not, not always. Um, yeah. But the key there is two solid incomes yeah. with no dependents. That is the key. Because as soon, think, you can have a, two solid incomes. As soon as you get a dependent, like borrowing capacity drops significantly. Plus one person potentially stops working. I mean, and yeah. for how long, who knows? Um, yeah, the interesting, I mean, we, we've got to get into prediction for 2022 and beyond because there's going to be some gold in there. Or, or, there's a couple of um, kind of, I wouldn't say cur curly, yeah, we'll call them curly. What, what would you sort of say to, to somebody who's sort of, because there's a lot of suburbs that have already gentrified. So, had, I mean, based on your criteria being close to the city or C, is it still possible to find these areas? I suppose is my yeah. Man, look, I haven't I haven't studied gent, uh, gentrified suburbs in the early stages of gentrification all over the country, but I've yeah. certainly looked at it for Adelaide. I do have a list of my top suburbs for 2022 around the country, but if oh. we're just focusing on gentrification, then in Adelaide it would be suburbs like uh, Kilkenny. Yeah, and Underdale, and Richmond, and Welland, and the really? old part of Bowdoin. They would be my five top picks. Yeah, interesting. Okay, we'll go go there. <laughs> Easy. Well, Obviously, not financial advice in any way, shape, or form. Um, what one of the questions I have is um, Torrensville. That was the that was the study. That's what it was based on. How's it mm -hmm. doing? Is it gentrified? Like, and what is the period? Oh, I still got room to go, still, but it, yeah. it has moved significantly yeah. up, but it still has room to grow. Because one of the benefits of the, the inner western gentrifying suburbs of Adelaide, it's between the city and the sea. Mm. But it's always been between the city and the sea, obviously. But the inner west, just like the inner west of Sydney and the inner west of Melbourne, also had a high concentration of industrial Areas, yeah. Right? Yep. But they're going, you know, Footscray, West Footscray, disappearing. Um, or when I say disappearing, I mean the industrial is moving out and yep. because the land is more valuable as residential than uh, industrial. So still room for growth. No problem there. Some some would yeah. argue the uh, Western Bulldogs football team might be in a bit of trouble after that defeat to the Demons uh, in the grand final this year. But yeah, um, that was phenomenal, wasn't it? It's just starstruck. Starstruck. Yeah. I mean, I'm a Swans fan, so what can I say? But um, anyway, <laughs> that's, uh, so let's, um, we're, we're mindful that we're, we want to sort of make sure we're respecting your time. So um, do we want to 
well, we, we should we, we will get to 2022 predictions before we get to that joe should we kind of pay our bills first oh yeah we got to do our sponsor we'll do our sponsor now and then we will jump straight into the market predictions because this is going to be a good one i'm excited Let's get the this. crystal ball out rub that in. yeah rub the crystal ball we've got to buy one of those actually Commercial property offers the highest cash flow in Australian property investing, offering exceptionally higher yields than residential. Now we're talking eight to 10% net yields. That's cash after all expenses, not this two to 6% gross that we see in the residential space. So for those that are starting out on their commercial investing journey, it can be exciting, but it's also a step not to be taken lightly. The expertise of a commercial buyer's agent can pay dividends to help you secure that high cash flow and high growth potential property. And this is why we recommend Steve Polisi of Polisi Property. With over six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He has seen it all and knows the best locations right for growth. In a previous life, Steve was a chartered mechanical and structural engineer, so he draws on his mathematical and analytical skills that he's developed to break down what works best in commercial property. As with engineering, same goes with commercial property. It's based primarily on the numbers. So if you're curious about diversifying into commercial property, you have access to $100,000 in cash or in equity, book a call with Steve today and find that perfect asset for you. I, I must. Uh, that's that's a that's a cool video. Anyway, what's what's Joe, Joe still running? Oh, we've lost. I thought we've lost Joe, but that's um. We, we are back, and we are into the final segment, and this is where it's going to get extraordinarily juicy in terms of twenty twenty two and beyond. Um, I, I don't know who knows what twenty 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 two is going to throw at us. Um, just even saying twenty twenty two is quite hard. So, Pete, so what, what do you sort of see coming up in our horizon, just at a macro level, and, and even or go as micro as you want? But what are you kind of, what are you envisioning? Uh, in the medium to long term, I see Australia entering a golden era. Mm. Uh, we have a roaring, roaring twenties, perhaps, or a roaring. Yeah, 20s? yeah, it could be. I mean, I wasn't around in the nineteen twenties. I might look at, but I wasn't around back in the nineteen twenties. Um, but I wouldn't like to for it to be exactly the same as the 1920s because 1929 yeah, we had a stock market attack, crash yeah. and the Great Depression. So we don't want to go there. <laughs> but what I see here is similar to what's happened in other at other times in modern history. I think number one, we're going to have an increase in overseas migration. For the last two years, we virtually had no one coming in. So not only are we going to open up our doors to the usual number but I think we will be ramping it in because the whole world needs more skilled migrants in particular, mm -hmm. right? And Australia is, is certainly seen as a favoured destination. I mean, if we just look at, you know, my field, education, mm -hmm. so basically international students will either pick the U UK, US, Canada or Australia. Well, yeah. US, they're too scared they're going to be shot now. UK is the weather's awful. Canada's too cold. Yeah. And so Australia. And, and for those people <laughs> looking to migrate right. somewhere else to an English-speaking country, they're going through the same thing. You know, Australia is clean. We've got blue skies. Um, good chance for a job. But I suppose there's a good chance for a job in any of those countries that I just mentioned. But, uh, and we're a, I mean, we're a long way away from the action, but in some cases that's a, that's a good thing. So uh, plus, you know, compared to the rest of the world, Australia's coped with COVID-19 pretty well. So we are on the radar of many, many people. So big influx of migrants, just like happened back in the um, 1950s and 60s when they came from Southern Europe. We had a big boom in the economy and the property market. Then in the 80s, we had a big boom from people coming from Southeast Asia and, and a pro big uh, property boom back in the mid-80s again. And then uh, early 2000s, a lot of people from the subcontinent, India, another property boom, economic boom in the early 2000s. So I can see that uh, happening again. Um, so, but, you know, that's people... Very, that's, that's, people a big, that's a big statement. I mean, I know it's a big that. statement, but, but uh, before people say, what, what's this Blake talking about, right? Yeah, okay. so when, I wrote, when I wrote my book, The Top Australian Suburbs, back in 2008, and like yep. many other so-called experts, I went back and tested my predictions or my forecasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right? And out of the 107 suburbs that I picked, 
a, the, the vast majority did what I said they would, which was to, to perform better than the average for that for that particular capital city. Now, I didn't get 100%, but I would have got given myself a HD, which is a high distinction. Um, uh, like in, in Sydney, I picked 20 suburbs, right? Yeah, if I could just brag just for a little bit before I give you the 2022 You deserve suburbs, it. Right? <laughs> Sydney, in that 10-year period, Sydney property prices increased by 98%. They almost doubled. However, some of the suburbs that I picked did much better than that. Arncliffe, one hundred and forty-six percent. Banksia, one hundred and forty-one percent. Campsie, one hundred and fifty-five percent. Chippendale, one hundred and sixty-two percent. Cogra, one hundred and sixty percent. Let's go to Melbourne. Melbourne in that time did eighty-nine percent, right? But some of the suburbs that I picked did much better than that. So I've got. Braybrook, 149%. Um, any other really big one? Yeah. Frankston, uh, you, for those people that live in Melbourne, you think, oh, Frankston, why would I live there? Frankston, 108%. Morty Alec, 119%. Now, I didn't get them all right, but the ones that I got wrong in Melbourne, all right, I picked Brunswick East. It did 86% when the average was 89 Well. You know, it wasn't a huge difference. And I picked Maidstone. Well, Maidstone did 88%, but the Melbourne did 89%. Well, that's yeah. you know, pretty cool. I don't know. You, 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 might, you might just get a, might just get a credit or a, or a, or a D for that <laughs> one. But, um, did, did, you, did you do the study? You didn't do the study in Brisbane? It was in kind of... Yeah, yeah Brisbane suburbs. Yeah, Brisbane I did 20 in all the major capital cities, 20 suburbs in all the major capital cities. And I did two or three in the smaller capital cities. So Brisbane, again, Brisbane did uh, 25% in that 10-year period. For some of the better ones that I picked, Kelvin Grove, 45%. Lutwich, 57%. Norman Park, 48%. Sandgate, 59%. I mean, the two that I missed out on, so I got Lota, which is on the coast in Brisbane, it did 20% instead of... The average of 24 and a half and Fairfield, which I've picked for next year, 17% instead of 24 and a half. Okay. What do you mean you've picked for next year? I reckon Fairfield is one of the top suburbs to look at for 2022. But you know, if, if we do the show again in 12 months' time, there will not be a completely different list of suburbs because suburbs, unlike shares, take a long time to become good. Like the the book, I mean, I haven't actually read the book top top 100 stocks, which written, what's published by the same publisher that I used. But I suspect many of the suburbs from one year to the next are quite different. But if I was oh, to yeah. write my book again, many of the suburbs that I had in there uh, all those years ago would still be in there because suburbs take decades to come good. I don't, I don't think many uh, many people are picking Afterpay as a top stock for 2022. I mean, given <laughs> what, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just heard some news about Afterpay, so I don't know. But yeah, that's, that's interesting. I'd love to do that if, if you're open to it, because I'd love to hear how. So, what, what are you, um, how many how many states have you picked the top top suburbs for 2022 in? Have you done it across? Oh, I haven't done them all, but I've done lots of them. So, South Australia, I've got Port Norlunga, Theberton, oh, yep. Torrensville, still in there. I told you, it's still, still got room for improvement. I love it. Queensland, I've got Fairfield, Will and Gabba. Oh, Will and Gabba. But Will and Gabba's a no brainer, isn't it? Yeah, I had that in the book. Gabba has I had been... that in the book thirteen years ago. I didn't know that the Olympics yeah. were going to be awarded to them, but <laughs> I had the I had that in the book all those years ago. ACT, Narrabunda, Tasmania, uh, North Hobart, Victoria, yes. West Footscray, New South Wales, Tempe, and St Peters. <laughs> uh, oh, and another one for Queensland is Annerley. So Annerley, Fairfield, Will and Gabba, you know, pretty close to each other. Uh, I'm excited. I'm excited for the next ten, the next ten years to see how they perform. Yeah, yeah. Get me on in ten years' time, and we'll see how yeah. they see how that goes. Um, I, I was interested. I'm interested to hear your um thoughts and opinions because we had uh, there was a news article out today or yesterday or something that that um said there's going to be this new flock and supply of uh, properties to the market, um, which is going to fundamentally stop the property market in its tracks. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? 
In property, supply is generally a result of demand. A developer is not going to build 100 houses in the hope of selling them. They have built one display home, sold 100 contracts, and then they build the other 99 homes. Even in apartments, no apartment developer is going to build 200 apartments and hope that they sell them all. For them to get the money, the bank says, we need to see 200 exactly. contracts for 200 apartments. There's demand for 200 apartments. We'll build 200 apartments. Mm -hmm. So... I don't think, yeah, no. and, demand, and supply, new supply or new housing is only 2% of the whole market. It's very hard to affect the whole market when you're only, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, when you're only looking mm. at 2%. And it's not like that 2% can go to 4%. Because look at what's happened when we've tried to increase our supply, right? There's building yeah. shortages. Yeah. Uh, there's supply shortages. There's labor shortages. Labor. Yeah, 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 build is. So, uh, you know, we will, we probably went from two and two percent to two and a half percent. Mathematically, that's a twenty five percent increase, but it's still not, it's, not a lot. It's not even moving the dial. Yeah. Steam of things. Still not. Joe, maybe we need to become builders. I was, I was builder investors. Like, I, uh, uh, be careful, cool. boys. Some builders are going to be going under very soon yeah. Oh, yeah. because so of the lack it? of cash flow. Because yeah. they haven't been able to get the materials, they haven't been able to build. They don't have the cash flow for the business. Doesn't matter, you know, how many properties you own, how many fantastic looking utes you own. If you don't flow. have the cash flow, you're dead in the water. Yeah. Speaking of cash, cash flow, flow. I'll, I'll throw a bit of a left field. You may not have um, developed a, a kind of a large view on this, but Evergrande, um, do you have any? Have you read much about that, or what do you what do you sort of thought? China. On? Yeah, what is that? Yeah, I, the, the Chinese, the Chinese government controls the property market. They're not going to let it fail. It's too big to fail, mate. They're going to let it yeah, fail for them. Yeah, <laughs> yep. Interesting. Yeah, I was just thinking because it, it seems to sort of pop up every now and then. They miss their kind of debt payments, and I'm like, well, I don't know what. Why is that? Is that actually? Is that a big? I mean, it's not a Lehman Brothers moment, I suppose. I mean, I don't want to make massive, big, bold predictions because I haven't researched enough. But um, interesting. Well, should we get into some Q and A, and then we'll, we'll, we'll um, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I, I, I don't know about you, Joe, but while we're getting firing up some questions, J Joe can ask his to not token, but Joe can ask his uh, burning question. He usually has a couple. No, I haven't got burning questions. Um, but I do have a question about the the bank lending and serviceability, and your thoughts around um the recent changes that the banks have made when it comes to serviceability, and then just recently how it appears that they're attacking interest only loans a little bit. Is, do you see so that kind they're of... They're looking... Yeah, look, I actually spoke to my business banker yesterday because I'm refinancing some of my loans and we had a you know, big picture discussion about this. Mm -hmm. And they're looking to mitigate their risk. Interest only is a riskier loan than principal on interest, right? Uh, but I think one thing that they haven't covered for is commercial property because even though uh, residential property has proven to be very resilient after economic downturns, the 1970s recession, 80s, 90s recession, global financial crisis, and, you know, the COVID-19 induced recession. Can't say the same for commercial property. You know, you know look, look at us now. I mean, we're online, all right, which is the norm now. Even if you're in the same city, people do a lot of stuff online. So, so far as work is concerned, not all of us will be working from home every day of the week. But many of us will be working from home some days of the week. If the boss doesn't need as many workers in the office, the boss does not need as much office space, the boss will not be leasing as much office space when the lease ends. We haven't seen it yet because often commercial leases run for years. But yeah. when those leases end, you'll see that there will be more and more office property and retail property because we're buying more online. Yep, become vacant. So you, you see this trend of working from home just just compounding and snowballing, and people becoming more comfortable and still getting results. And well, you boys seem to be the demographic, don't you? Want to have the flexibility from working from home? I'm used to coming to the office every day, but I'm hundred percent. I, I, I look, I'm, I'm very extrovert, or well, quite extroverted. And I, when I started working from home, I was for the first two weeks, I was not miserable, but 
I got in a, bit, a little bit of a funk because I loved the kind of talking at the water cooler. But then I adjusted mm. and, I, and, I, and I thought, you know, like, why do I want to sit in a, in a, in a hot sm- train with a bunch of smelly people? Why do I want to commute 50 minutes every day? I don't want to do that. Why, why, I can just roll out of bed at sort of 8 o'clock or whatever it is and, and, and walk to my office and, I'm, and I'm, I'm good. I don't – I can socialize on the weekend or whenever it is. So, yeah. yeah you see, I'm, I'm on – I'm on, I'm on the other side of the fence of this because I manage a team of, of um, eight people and it is so difficult to manage a team remotely, oh. like just trying to get things. I had a, a, a Slack. We were, we've just gone back into the office. Well, ages ago, we went back in the office and that. we had a Slack exchange and um, there were four people involved in this Slack exchange and it would have taken 20 minutes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But I'm like, we're all here. Let's just cover it off. 30 seconds, problem solved. Mm. So there are efficiencies while Certainly. working. Certainly. You need more Jeffs. But you need more Jeffs in your team, Joe. That's the problem. I haven't got enough oh. Jeffs. Younger people in particular are demanding that flexibility. And mm. so if employers want to keep good employees, you need to offer that. That's true. Um, well, just before we jump them. in. The... Oh, sorry, sorry, go, mate. No, you... I was going to say, we've got some cracking questions I'd love to, to get to. A, a couple All right, of let's get into them. Go, okay. Well, I was just going to share this really, really quickly. Oh, look, I get to control it. That's fun. Um, this is um, from the nineteen from 1987. Um, this is overall annual capital city home price growth over the period. So when we start talking doom and gloom all the time that we read it in the media, um, these are the price growths over this period collectively. So... Um, this is from Andrew Wilkinson, so I've got to give him a shout out. This is the results of the work that he's done. Um, pulled get him from, on show. yep, get him on. Come on, come on, Andrew. Um, but you can see at 2000, we've had three under um, negative, right? Over the entire years from 18, 1987. So just put that into context. When you're reading the bank's predictions, when you're reading all the forecasts of 10, 20, 30, 50, 80% drops and all this craziness, we've had three periods. Of under four percent, one under five. Negative, negative percentages. Yeah. So, uh, and I suppose, Joe, this this is like every capital city, isn't it? Like which? which yeah, it's uh, all of them combined. Yeah. Okay. So, so obviously, um, there are some some are going. It's going to be doing a, a waves, but just something to be thinking course. about when you're you're reading all these negative news articles because it's the way to sell the paper, you know. It is, and ratings. Yeah. Right. So there, there was one, something we we talked a little bit about. So Junior, he asked this, and this is one that you didn't quite nail in your in your study. But what do what you when, when he says how about Perth? What is he? I, I, I'm going to kind of extrapolate that and say, what are your thoughts longer? Like you're talking sort of three to five to ten years on Perth. What do you sort of? Because I'm being a bit disappointed. Not good. I tell you why. <laughs> All right. So I've got the core logic stuff up here. Yep. Oh, so well, you can uh, share it if you if you want. Maybe. Can I? Yeah, if you yeah, hit share, hit Pete, on the on oh, the. Right. Oh, Hopefully, let you. It's like Zoom here. Share screen. <laughs> yeah. You select share which screen. one you want to share. It's easiest for two months. Uh, share screen. Oh, look at that. Your boy says yeah, the call logic data. There he is. Yeah. yeah. Just zoom in a little bit if you could. Oh, now, you're asking, now you're asking the 60-year-old bloke some tech questions. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Is that what you want? Oh, oh. there he is. Oh, mate. <laughs> Still got some left in the tank. <laughs> oh, plenty. <laughs> so let's have a look here, all right? Perth. So Perth in the last month has done 0.18%. It was negative in October as well. Yeah. And... Uh, Darwin is not doing too well. So other than Darwin, which has gone backwards, it's the worst. In most recent times, it's the worst performing capital city. But a month is not a long time in property. So let's have a look at, um, hang on, where we go? Let's have a look at three months. So let me just make it a bit bigger. Nice. Right? Even if we look at, see, it's in the last yeah. three months, it's only done yeah. a half a percent. Yeah. So... You know, we've all had the good times because of COVID, so far as property is concerned, I mean. But the steam is coming out of the Perth property market. So let me stop sharing. Steam's so coming what is, out. What is, what is, what is, what is, what is you doing? Doing? this new platform? Oh, well. 
There you go. Well, that's the great thing about this uh, this kind of medium. We have a we can get visual, which is very rare um, from a podcast side of things. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but people are starting to say this is just the beginning, right? We're starting to get that flattening. We've been we've been dip. We went high, then we dipped, and now we're hitting that equilibrium of of starting to to take off. Not not the case. What is going to drive the Perth market? Mining, probably, or is it mining or the resources? Or... Well, oh, yeah. iron ore. We've we got a trade issue with China. Yeah. I mean, luckily, our iron ore is, is, such, is of such a quality that it is a high demand around the world, right? So there's the... But the Western Australians have had iron ore for decades, right? And the market really hasn't done much since 2006. It's just, you know, bumped along the bottom. And here we are, 2006. Here we are 15 years later, and it's finally caught up. I mean, there was it. It did do well two thousand in the mid, the mid middle of uh, last decade, but um, look, you know, I, I, I got nothing against Perth. There's some lovely people that come from Perth, but you know, the the stats show that the puff is coming out of the market. Property goes in cycles. Lots of things in the economy go in cycles because demand and supply is not an equilibrium. One goes forward, then the other one has to catch up, but then it goes too far, and then it catches up. Perth has done it. I think Perth has done its dash, but and, and Melbourne. So Perth's not on, on its lonesome. But when you look at those stats, the two that stand out are Brisbane and Adelaide. So, when you you know you can do there's the stats. You can do your own analysis and come to your own conclusions. But I don't think Perth is the place to be for the short to medium term. Yeah, you said, I, I, you, said Mel, you said Melbourne as well. Why? Uh, why Melbourne? Melbourne, um, from a property cycle point of view, it had it had two really good cycles of growth since the GFC, um, and I think from a COVID nineteen point of view, it, it doesn't have a good reputation. I mean, lots of people are leaving the big cities anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, generally when people came from overseas, they flocked to Sydney and Melbourne. Will they continue to flock to Melbourne based on how they dealt with COVID? And you can work remotely and it's easy to get permanent residency if you come to the smaller capital cities like Adelaide or the Gold Coast, you know? Maybe you, you start... Sorry, are you starting to see inquiries um, like at the uni coming through a lot more? Um, um, no, look, like we lucked out because things? the UK and the US and Canada opened up their borders back in September. Quicker, yeah. Because oh, that's oh, the please. Northern Hemisphere academic year start. Uh, so we've missed out on that intake. But... We, like, we were supposed to open up today, the 1st of December, to international students, but we've delayed that two weeks. But from my understanding, today's news, I don't think there were any new Omicron or very few, maybe, Omicron cases, new ones. So we delayed it two weeks. Maybe we might bring it back and say, well, international students can start coming next year. But, you know, in regards to property, you know, the international students are only tens of thousands. When hundreds of thousands of people come into the country, where yeah. are they going to live? Rents are already increasing significantly. Most of these people are not allowed to buy because they don't have permanent residency. They have to yes. rent. Too where are yeah. they going to live? Students will yeah. go back into apartments, right, because they've had a huge vacancy rate. All right. But yeah. where are those families going to live that are coming here to migrate to Australia? Where are they? Yeah. Going to live? And is, is, there a, is there a trend that you see with international people come over to Australia? Is there a, a kind of sequence or um, something that happens, right? They go in, they rent, they stay in a place so for general, two years. To get permanent residency, depending on which visa you're in, but the most common visa, and I can't remember its term, is um, the so what we've got is they come for two years. Sorry. You need to live there for two years and work for at least one. Then you can apply, all right? So they go from renters, and for many of them, they see Australia as the land of opportunity where maybe in their country they couldn't afford to buy, 
And so here, here both, you know, uh, both husband and wife can work. They might be able to work two jobs, three jobs, save a deposit, buy a house. So it's the first the couple of years, definitely rent, but the idea is they're going to buy. And they're not going to stop at one. They'll buy as many as they can. Because yeah. mm. they, they've seen the other side of the coin. See, most Australians haven't seen how the other side of the world lives. But if you come from a, especially if you come as a refugee, Australia really is the land of opportunity we, we definitely are i mean having having traveled a few places you can um, you sort of see i mean not there's some really lovely places out there in all but um yeah there's not a, there's not not anywhere near as much opportunity as us um let's 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 crack on to two quick questions and then we'll let you go for the and let you enjoy your evening so the crystal asked a question i'm interested in your thoughts on this with with, with this boom where do you i mean I, I don't know if you can answer that first part but Sure, surely there's a ceiling because 104. Let's just say the increase to 900k. You know, the the median is 100 900k. How, how do we sort of where, where do you sort of see that landing? Like, um, all right. So the, so they've used the term unaffordable. So we need to break housing affordability into two components. One is what I call housing attainability. That is the ability to save a deposit to get a house. Yep. The other one is housing maintainability. That is the ability to maintain mortgage repayments. In the current market, mainly because interest rates are so low, it's actually easier to pay off a mortgage today than it was 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago, right? The hard part is the deposit. So providing the bank of mum and dad come to the party, the people that have the serviceability to buy property will continue to buy property. There is no doubt like that there is in more mature property markets around the world. But, you know, young people don't even aspire to own a home because it is just so expensive. And when we talk yeah. about home, you know, home in Australia is not the same as home in Europe or home in Asia. Most, mm. most homes in ur dense urban areas are apartments. So yeah. when we say, oh, you know, median, median uh, home price in Australia is 900. Well, the average 70% of all dwellings are detached dwellings on their own block of land. You can't say that for many urbanized areas around the world. So, you know, we need to be talking about apple, not just apples and apples, but, you know, red delicious apples and red delicious apples, not tiny apples and big apples. <laughs> Not, 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 the, not, not the gala with the red delicious. I mean, yeah. Correct, mate. Not your little cherry tomatoes oh, yeah. with your... I think we'll, um, we'll finish off. <laughs> oh, love an analogy I do love here. the cherry tomatoes, especially <laughs> when you put them in. Yeah. Um, Chuck them in a salad. So well, I think we've kind of finished. This might be a quick quick answer. So if it's a quick answer, we might be able to squeeze one more in. But somebody said, southeast region in Adelaide. I think I know your answer to that, but you probably... Oh, yeah, look, I, southeast, I would go places like Goodwood. That's probably more south. Um, I'd stick to the inner west. I, I'm not sure why you want southeast, <laughs> but unless you want to live there, that's different. Yeah, you know, buying for investment, yeah. different criteria to living there. But I'd be is, looking at is the Happy inner Valley west. in the southeast. Would is nah, that too far from town, mate? Too far from yeah, town. I'm just I'm trying to get my bearings because I mean I've I've done Google, but I'm just kind of wondering what southeast region looks like in Adelaide. Uh, yeah. Well, what southeast generally, we have the the sea is one boundary, and then the Adelaide Hills is another boundary. So the southeast yeah. is not a huge area because if we're talking about the Adelaide Plains, you know you probably couldn't go much further than seven or eight k's from the CBD before you start to go up into the foothills. Mm. My my last question is: we, How excited are you about the uh, ABS data coming? Oh, not really. <laughs> um, oh, unlike no. other, uh, mate, unlike <laughs> one of the reasons is because you have to sit down too much, and I've I've, uh, I've yeah. had enough of sitting down. You know, I <laughs> I don't want to spend more than I have to sitting mm. down. I'm quite an active just... person. I go running. I go riding. I don't want to do any more sitting down. I'm happy. You know. I'm happy to do the research that I need to to inform my students 
or to inform like the general public that I'm doing here. Mm. But yeah. you know, you know, waiting at the waiting at the computer for them to be released. No, mate, that's not me. <laughs> that's not you. You know, hit and refresh. No. Uh, yeah. Can you with with the research that you've done? Do you over? Can you easily like how long does it take you to overlay that research over the top of different suburbs and different areas? Like, have you worked it out to that point? Or I did with with the book. I used the same methodology for every capital city. Oh, yeah. fantastic! Oh, so it's based off of. I haven't read. I haven't haven't read the book. Uh, the first book, book, Top Australian Suburbs. Yeah, Top Australian Suburbs. Let's, let's read it. I'll yeah. get it. We'll do, we'll, I've got it. We'll do a review. <laughs> Well, Peter, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to run through us all, run all of us through this. You're, uh, as they say in the comments here, hang on, let me find it. Somebody wanted this, to say what? This dude, dude is, is an, an OG. 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 Original <laughs> gangster. I think that, that's that's what the term is. Isn't it, that's a compliment. Oh. That's a compliment. Oh, I was going to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm too old. I don't know what that means. All right. okay. <laughs> I was, I was a little yes. worried. Actually, sorry for that person. Sorry, I deleted that because I thought he was saying it was an og, as in like an like ogre. I, was, I thought an ogre. <laughs> no, like an og, as in like an og, like caveman, like Shrek, favorite yeah. demographic under um, bridges. <laughs> Anything under a bridge, please. So, if somebody, I want, I want to give you an opportunity. When, when is the book with Margaret that you've you've written? That's a very book? good question. So, Margaret's looking doing her bit now. It should be the first half of next year. Um, yep. So it's on small scale residential development. Fantastic! Wow, that's if, if you need a, if you need somebody to have a chat with, we're more than if you reach out to us and we'll we'll have a chat because I want to hear small micro development. I think is a very interesting yeah. topic. It's mm -hmm. up and coming, I think, and I'll definitely write the foreword if asked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that, uh, what, what's the best place if if somebody wants one's one's kind of universal place to check you out? What is the best place to check you out, Pete? Have you got a few? Uh, yeah, look, well, go to the. Uh, I'm not very good on social media, but go to Facebook, the Property Professor. Check it out. That's right. Normally, you know, if I write an article or if I'm quoted in an article, that's where I'll put it up. Awesome. Yeah. Or past then, students can join the graduates of the Property Professor, but there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be, you know, um. It's probably hundreds, thousands of them over the years, but they probably don't all want to keep in touch. Yeah. But certainly the Property Professor Facebook page, that's the one. Mm -hmm. and people, I just out. want to give you a bit of, bit of platic, plat, platitude. People are saying your, your podcasts are awesome as well. And oh, thank you very much for that. Yeah, that's the Property Planner Buyer and Professor podcast. Yeah. That's with, um, what is it, with Kate hey, Bakos? Kate Bakos and David Johnson, yeah. Johnson, yeah. There, there he is. There he is. I, I, I just want to say a really um, big thank you for taking your time. Uh, I know your time is very valuable. So, and being the being the educator and being kind of the one of the one of the really shining voices of reason in the industry, Peter, as well. It's um and being um you're on uh, Pippa, right? Pippa, chairperson of the Property Investment Professionals of Australia. Basically, yeah. I you know whether it's educating or whether it's my role as chairperson, I say it as I see it. I may not, you know, some people may not agree with me. But, you know, I again, I do my research. If I'm forecasting, I look at what's happened in the past. There's no guarantee that what's happened in the past is going to happen in the future. So you, you've got to try and look at well, what's different in the future, what could be different in the future. You know, like we can't forecast that property values are going to increase at the same rate as they did in the previous 50 years because inflation is not at the same rate, neither are interest rates. So how can you expect property yeah, prices yeah. to go up at the same pace? For example, yeah, and sing single incomes and double incomes that went yeah, from single to double. Yeah. It's not like we're going to have triple. Well, we might. Maybe that's a new stat to look for uh, the the triplex couples. We'll see. <laughs> oh, gee. amazing. Let's let, let's there leave it go, on yeah. that. Let's thank leave it on that. Thank you very much, and thank you all <laughs> those other people that were uh, watching. Thank you. See you later. Thank you, Peter. Let's go buy a property. See you guys. Bye bye. <laughs>